Getting underway always begins with properly loading the boat. The captain is responsible for every aspect of onboard safety, so take this as seriously as your other duties. If the boat is wet from dew or rain, be sure to dry all walking surfaces before the crew boards to prevent slippage. You'll also have a better day if your first mate doesn't sit on a wet seat. Whenever possible, hand the gear to someone in the boat. Trying to board with your hands full can cause you to lose your balance. Not a good way to start your day. When it's time to load your crew, make sure they step in carefully, one at a time, with you standing by to lend a helping hand to anyone who needs it. If it's a small boat, step in as near to the center as possible. Okay. Do not step onto the gunnel, as this may cause the boat to tip and you could lose your balance. Never allow any Action. kids included to jump from the dock into the boat. <laughs> Action. Be aware of the conditions. If the waves rock the boat, you'll need extra care while loading and boarding because of uncertain footing. Another common sense item, always wear soft-soled or boating shoes. Hard soles have no grip on slippery surfaces and can damage your upholstery. Some shoes designed for boating have special siped soles that help grip wet or slippery decks. You may have noticed that this family had their life preservers on before boarding. Though it's not necessarily the law, it's always a good idea to wear PFDs whenever you're on the water. Whether you wear them or not, they have to be in the boat and readily accessible. I can't stress this enough. Check all state and local regulations before launching. The rules will vary from state to state, county to county, and even lake to lake. So be prepared. You can easily access this information by searching the internet for boating regulations specific to your area. Think you're ready? One last thing before leaving the dock. We refer to it as a float plan, which simply means to let someone like a friend or relative know what your plans are. This is especially important on large bodies of water where it may be easy to get lost or stranded. Let them know where you're headed and what time you plan to get back. <laughs> then don't forget to inform them when you return. If you're not back by a certain time, they can alert the authorities to begin a search. It's a simple measure to help prevent you from spending an uncomfortable night on the lake if something goes wrong. For an extended voyage, we recommend you use the U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary's float plan form, which can be downloaded at www.floatplancentral.org. Consult your owner's manual for more information on proper seating. For proper seating, refer to the seating diagram in your boat if it has one. Read and follow all seating instructions, warning labels, and placards to ensure the safety of your passengers. Some boats are equipped with raised seats for fishing. While these seats are great for fishing, they are not approved for or safe for seating when running. This is extremely important. Fishing seats should never be used when the boat is underway or powered by anything other than the electric trolling motor. This goes for raised gunnels, decks, or platforms as well. Sitting anywhere other than an approved seat could cause the person to be thrown overboard and be injured or drowned. Everyone must be in an approved seat before leaving the dock. Got it? Everyone in an approved seat before leaving the dock. Remember, we're not trying to overload you with information. We want you to have a wonderful day on the water, and of course, that includes being safe. Once everyone has a safe seat and the weight has been evenly distributed around the boat, it's safe to leave the dock. By evenly distributed, I mean you should not be too heavy on one side or have too much weight in the bow or stern that could cause handling problems later. When you're ready to leave the dock, check for other traffic, make sure the path is clear, and ease away at idle speed. Never put the boat in gear if there are swimmers nearby. Depending on the wind and current, it may be easier to back away from the dock. Angle the engine away from the dock and then put it in reverse. Continue in reverse until you have sufficient room to maneuver. Remember that when in forward, the boat will pivot around the bow, so allow lots of room for a turn. If you're truly an inexperienced boater, it's best to take someone knowledgeable with you to help you with the basics of docking and maneuvering. A boat operates very differently from a car and is affected by winds and currents as well. So learning different techniques in different conditions is important to safe and trouble-free boating. If you are unfamiliar with the body of water you'll be on, 
always refer to a chart so you can avoid any submerged obstacles such as dangerous and destructive rocks or pilings hidden just under the water. Many safe channels are marked with channel markers, showing you the safe way to go. If you took our advice and went to a boating safety course, you'll have a better understanding of channel markers, which usually point you in the right direction or away from hazards. You can also equip your boat with a Global Positioning System, or GPS. A GPS is a very useful tool, but should never be used in place of a current navigational chart. Ask your dealer about the right GPS for your boating needs. While on the water, you'll want to observe all warning signs, such as no wake zones. You are responsible for your wake and any damage caused by it, so you'll want to be sure to stay at an idle speed until you clear all no wake zones. And even when clear of official no wake zones, a bit of courtesy is always welcome when it comes to your wake. We'll show you in just a few minutes how big that wake can be at certain speeds. If you are new to boating, it's best to go slow at first. Get a feel of how the boat handles. Some models will tend to wander at idle and low speeds. This is inherent in some designs, so don't be alarmed. While underway, always keep one hand on the wheel and one on the throttle. This allows you to react quickly to any situation that may arise unexpectedly. Here's some information about the mystery trim switch. Make sure your trim is all the way down before increasing speed. This will allow the boat to plane quicker. At higher speeds, too little up trim can cause the boat to plow, making steering more difficult and negatively affecting fuel efficiency. If the trim is too high when you first increase speed, the bow will rise more, making it hard to see ahead. This also creates a huge wake. If the trim is way too high, you'll cause the propeller to cavitate or blow out. If you don't cavitate or blow out, you may get into a porpoising situation where the boat bounces, sometimes violently. It may take a little practice, but if you slowly increase the trim when you're on a plane, you'll feel what we call the sweet spot, where the trim is just right. That's also the point when the steering becomes easier and no longer pulls to one side. If you're uneasy about the trim and how to use it, ask a knowledgeable buddy to give you a lesson or you can consult your tracker dealer. It's really not too hard to master, but it can be confusing at first. When you're comfortable with the trim all the way down, slowly increase your speed, always looking around for other traffic that could be on an intercepting course. When and only when you're comfortable, increase to a planing speed by applying full throttle until the boat planes then reduce the throttle to a comfortable speed. Add a little up trim and get a feel for it. But if you are at all uneasy with this, slow back down until you're ready. The comfortable cruising range for most boats will be between 3,000 and 4,000 RPMs. Cruising speed is a perfect time to get comfortable with the trim switch. You'll be able to use the trim and feel the effect it has on the hull. There's a sweet spot for every hull at different trim and speed combinations. You'll know it when you find it. If you run too slow, the bow will ride too high. You'll be making a large wake and burning more gas. Operating at full throttle can be dangerous and burns a lot more fuel than running in the mid-range. We can't be in the boat with you, so it has to be your judgment as to when you're ready for advanced speed and maneuvering. Use common sense. Once again, you are the captain. Everyone's safety is in your hands. Look around occasionally to make sure everyone is remaining in their seats. No one should be standing, leaning over the side, or dangling hands or feet over the side. It's very important to remember that a boat has no brakes. Practice stopping a few times so you'll have a feel of how much distance it takes to actually stop. The normal procedure is to bring the throttle all the way back to idle speed and trim the motor completely down. Put the shifter into neutral, then when the boat has slowed to walking speed, you can shift to reverse to completely stop your forward motion. Never shift from forward to reverse until the boat has completely slowed. This could result in serious damage to the engine and the lower unit and possibly injure a passenger with a sudden stop. Operating in rough water presents a few challenges for safe and comfortable boating. 
Most boats provide the best ride when they meet waves bow first or on one of the bow quarters. You must always be aware of the conditions that could affect your passengers. When you encounter rough water, warn the passengers and slow the boat to a comfortable crossing speed. These waves can often surprise you, so always keep a sharp eye out. If you see a large boat cross somewhere in front of you, you can bet there's a big wake coming, just waiting to catch you off guard. Other obstacles can be out there too. Keep a sharp eye out for floating debris such as logs, trees, or water skis. Never run too close to shore at high speed. You can find all kinds of hidden dangers just waiting to damage your boat or injure a passenger. It's that common sense thing that I keep mentioning. You can also learn to read the water. Look at the bank to get an indication of the depth of the water. A gradual sloping bank will generally indicate shallow water, while a steep bank or cliff will generally indicate deeper water. Most major waterways have a system of channels designated with navigational markers. Learn the system for the waters where you boat and you'll find it helpful for staying in deep water. The markers are usually numbered and these numbers show on nautical charts and on GPS navigational screens, helping you keep track of your location. Markers are also color-coded red or green to designate which side of the marker you should be on. This can be a little confusing, particularly around the confluence of two or more waterways. So again, check the chart or the GPS. Tubing, wakeboarding, and water skiing add lots of family fun to a day on the water, but it takes added care to make sure these activities remain safe. Always use a proper towing hook or pylon, or a harness designed to properly attach the ski line to the boat. Have an experienced driver handle the wheel while towing, and also assign a responsible observer to keep their eyes on those being towed at all times. Review with the skier the basic hand signals for towing. You can find these in your owner's manual. Make sure the skier, driver, and observer know and understand these signals. Skiers are required by law to wear approved flotation devices designed for water sports. Choose an area for skiing where there's minimal boat traffic and stay well clear of swimming beaches, docks, or underwater obstructions. Never ski in low light conditions, rain, or fog. Other boaters may not see you. Upon entering the water, the skier should move a short distance away from the boat. Make sure the trim is down, the wheel is straight, and the area ahead is clear. Once the line is tight, wait for the skier's universal hit it command, then slowly but firmly add throttle. Once the boat is on plane, you can reduce throttle to achieve the speed most comfortable for the skier. Be aware that the force exerted on the tow line may affect the steering somewhat, particularly on smaller boats. Keep skiers at least 100 feet away from other boats, shorelines, or obstructions at all times. In some states, any time a skier is in the water, the tow boat is required to raise a ski flag, cautioning other boats in the area to look out for a skier in the water. Be sure to check your local regulations. If a fallen skier sees traffic close by, he should raise his ski high out of the water and wave it to alert the driver of his location. With the observer keeping an eye on the skier, the driver should make a smooth but quick return for the pickup. Approach the skier in the water at idle speed always on the driver's side, going to neutral and turning the engine off as you get close. Never back up to a skier or swimmer in the water. Also, keep an eye on the ski line to make sure it stays clear of the prop and does not wrap around the skier. We all hate to see a good day on the water come to an end, but at some point, we need to head for home. Time to test your docking skills. Here are some good tips to follow when returning to the dock. Slow down to idle speed while you're still well clear. This prevents your wake from causing problems for other boaters already tied up. It also reduces your momentum, making it easier to maneuver for a soft landing. In preparation for docking, have a crewman ready with dock lines attached to cleats on the bow and stern. Take note of traffic as well as wind and current. You'll need to adjust your approach and throttle setting accordingly. Slow down well in advance to minimize your wake and achieve a more manageable speed.
caution your passengers to keep hands and feet inside the boat while approaching the dock to avoid injury. To dock parallel, if possible, approach into the wind or current, whichever is stronger, at a 45 degree angle to the dock at idle speed. When the bow is within a few feet of the dock, turn the wheel away from the dock to bring the stern in close. As soon as the boat is parallel to the dock, put the motor in neutral, then turn the motor straight ahead and drop it into reverse, using a little throttle to stop the boat. Then back to neutral. The crewman should tie the bow first, since it's into the wind and could blow away from the dock. Then tie the stern. Don't turn the engine off until your boat is secured. You can adjust this technique based on wind and current. Now docking, particularly with added variables, is no easy feat, and if properly handled can cause damage to your crew, your equipment, <laughs> and your pride. Practice maneuvering when you can in open water, away from obstructions, and by all means with a more experienced captain to learn the finer points.